This episode of Food for Thought is brought to you by the listeners of this podcast. You can join others who are making this podcast possible by going to joyfulvegan.com slash donate. Thank you so much in advance for valuing Food for Thought. Today's topic is vegan Passover. Welcome to Food for Thought. My name is Colleen Patrick Gaudreau. I am your host. My work is dedicated to empowering people to live meaningfully, compassionately, and healthfully with abundance and joy. I've been doing this work for 23 years. This podcast is in its 17th year, and you can find lots of resources in my books in this podcast in the offshoot podcast called Animology, through my daily social media posts and through my joyful vegan trips, curated, all-inclusive vegan trips around the world. You can learn more about who I am and what I do by visiting my website, joyfulvegan.com. Hey everyone, I hope you're doing fabulously well. I'm super excited about today's topic, vegan Passover, vegan Seder. And you can say that it's part of a larger theme if you want to consider it part of a three-part series-ish. The topic of the vegan Passover, Passover Seder, has been in the queue for a very long time, as has its sister topic, Jewish cuisine. And you may recall that I did a four-part series on Italian cuisine, and that was the beginning of such episodes. There's so much to say about various cultures and cuisines and their plant-based roots and dishes around the world. And I wanted to start, or at least expand, from the Italy episode to Passover, and then we'll go into Jewish cuisine more generally. But I wanted to start with Passover because it's coming up, and it's something I'm looking forward to very personally, and it's been something that's been part of my life personally. For this particular Seder, for this particular Passover, David and I are driving down to Los Angeles to help prepare well, when I say we, we're both driving down, but I'm probably going to be, do, be doing most of the <laughs> preparation with my friend for the Seder itself. And we're participating in the Seder at the home of some very good friends. So I have a lot to share about this holiday and a lot to cover. So let's get started. I've talked in the past about my upbringing in general. My mother was Protestant. I grew up Catholic, though, because my father was Catholic, and that was the agreement that my parents made when my sister was born and then when I was born two years later. And so in addition to just growing up Catholic, I attended Catholic school for the first 10 years of my life, going through all the rites and sacraments from First Communion to Confirmation. And for the first 10 years of my life, especially, I remember being generally surrounded by nuns and priests and deacons who were friends of the family. Now, my parents divorced in 1980, and when they did, my mother moved us to a different town altogether, and my sister and I went to public school for the first time. The whole ordeal was jarring and traumatic, but that's another story. The bright side of being uprooted was the inevitable fact that I was introduced to new people and new experiences. Being in public school now, for the first time, I was meeting people outside of the religion and culture with which I was familiar, and it opened up worlds to me. And I've always been open to new worlds. I've always had a healthy dose of curiosity about the world, and about people, especially people who thought and lived and worshipped, in this case, differently than me. And I remember in the fifth grade, which was the first year I was in this new school, in this public school system, I remember making friends with a Jewish girl. There were other Jewish folks in the school, but I remember making friends with a Jewish girl in particular. And I loved her name. Her name was Yael. And I had never met a Yale before in the Catholic school that I went to. And I remember asking her what it meant. Even then, I was curiosity about etymology. <laughs> and I remember knowing so little about her Jewish faith that I asked questions. And I was very curious. And I was very open to learning about it. And I remember asking stupidly and naively if her family celebrated, wait for it, Thanksgiving. I, I was young, <laughs> and I had been sheltered, and I had a lot to learn. 
And I did learn. I was fascinated with Jewish rites and rituals. And I remember being so thrilled to attend Yael's bat mitzvah. I also remember almost choking to death that day. It, it, it has definitely left an impression on me because I had eaten a hard candy and it lodged in my throat. I'm really not kidding. I really could have died that day. I couldn't breathe. And I remember throwing myself over a chair and some people at that point saw me because, you know, it was dark and there was music on and people were dancing. And someone saw me throw myself over a chair uh, to dislodge this hard candy from my throat and I was struggling to breathe. And so they did help. They pounded on my back and I don't remember all the details, but I do remember seeing the little hard candy roll on the floor in front of me after it dislodged. So yeah, that's not the point of the story. <laughs> the point of the story is that I remember being really thrilled about Yale's bat mitzvah because there were rituals and rites that were very different than the rituals and rites that I was accustomed to in my Catholic upbringing. And after six years in that town, I was forced to move again. And I did so very reluctantly and very unhappily. Also a different story. But it was my junior year of high school and I was not keen on making new friends at that time. It was just so close to graduation and I had missed all of the friends that I made in this other town. Uh, but it was in this new town that I was immersed in Jewish culture through and through because that town had and has a very large Jewish population. In fact, it has one of the highest percentages of Jews in a U.S. town, 50%. And through friends and school and other activities in my life, I was exposed to Jewish customs and foods and holidays more than I had been before. So again, kind of reframing a bad situation into a positive one. It was something I remember appreciating and not to get too schmaltzy, but one of my closest friends at the time was a woman named Roz, who was a surrogate big sister to me at a time when I really needed one. She was about 10 years older than me and she was truly a role model for me, a very dear friend. And I'm saying schmaltzy a bit facetiously because schmaltz is an animology. For those who know, I am very interested in the origins of words, but especially the origins of words that have some kind of connection with animals. Now, schmaltz, unfortunately, isn't related to living animals, but it means excessively sentimental. It's Yiddish for chicken fat. That's what schmaltz means. Uh, it's from German uh, with Indo-European roots. Uh, there are other uh, Yiddish etymologies. Uh, we'll do those another time, like schlong and schmuck. They are also Yiddish etymologies. Animologies. How cool is that? So Roz, my big sister, my surrogate big sister, she was Jewish. And she was also a huge part of the Jewish community in her town. She lived just a town over from me, uh, but in the same county. In fact, she lived in the town. Did she grow up? In, yeah, I think she, she lived in the town. I'm trying to think if she lived in the town that my father grew up in. I think she eventually moved there. But she was, she was definitely raised in a town nearby in our shared county at that time. And that that town also had a very large Jewish and has a very large Jewish community. And I learned so much from her about life in general, being my surrogate big sister, and especially at a time when I really needed someone like her in my life. But I learned so much about Judaism. And it was through her that I was first introduced to Jewish cuisine. She was vegetarian, mostly vegetarian, plant-based, uh, and so the Jewish cuisine I was introduced to was plant-based, even that early on. I was vegetarian, also kind of switching off and on between pescatarian, but mostly vegetarian. And she was vegetarian. And so I learned a lot about Jewish cuisine, but plant-based Jewish cuisine and everything else in between. I learned about Jewish history. Her parents were actually Holocaust survivors. I learned a lot of Yiddish from her and Jewish customs. Hers was the first Jewish wedding I had ever attended. And I was there for the birth of her first daughter, as well as present for the naming ceremony of her daughter, Rachel. And Roz left a very strong and loving and lasting impression on me. I'm still in touch with her today, mostly on Facebook. She did come to not my wedding because we had a small wedding in California, but I did we did have a kind of engagement party, if you will, in New Jersey for the friends and family who weren't going to be coming to the wedding in California. So that's probably the last time I saw Roz, which was over 20 years ago, but we're in touch a lot on, on Facebook. And I'm so grateful to her and I'm so grateful 
for her. And she is someone who, like many do in our lives when we're young, she left such an impression on me, um, on who I was then and who I became. And her Jewishness was a huge part of that. I can't say that my first Passover Seder was with Roz, but that first Seder also left a huge impression on me. And it's something I think about often. I know I've talked in the past about rites and rituals and certainly how they apply to us as human beings, as us to animal advocates, etc. But I was always secretly envious of people who grew up with Passover after I just saw the power of storytelling, because that's a huge part of my own personal zeitgeist, and also symbolic foods and rituals. I've just always been really intrigued with that. And so I grew up with my own. I mean, obviously, I grew up with my own, just in my own culture, in my own family. We all do have our own rites and rituals and symbols. And certainly, as a Catholic, I had my own or a Christian, what have you. So, right, you know, we were celebrating Easter, you know, and today I don't uh, color Easter eggs or hide Easter baskets. I mean, I'm also an adult. I don't do that anymore and I don't have children. So I don't do that. But I do honor the elements of the Easter holiday I grew up with that emphasize renewal and rebirth and regeneration and hope, which is what the eggs at Easter really represent, right? For centuries, eggs in general, and especially during the spring holidays, have always been a symbol of hope, that life follows death, that spring follows winter, that hope follows despair. And that's the point. The chicken egg is the symbol of these ideas, for me, what's more important than the symbol is the meaning behind the symbol, the rebirth, the regeneration, the renewal, the hope, the life. And the egg is supposed to stand for these things, right? Now, we know in reality for egg-laying hens who are used and raised and kept and killed for human consumption of their eggs, there is no actual renewal and regeneration and rebirth and hope and life. There just isn't because of the circumstances of their very short and very sad lives. But being vegan, we can still experience the meaning, of course, of this holiday of Easter, for example, without compromising our values by using other symbols, right? So we can still use the egg as a symbol for life and birth and hope, right? But instead of actual eggs from chickens, we can paint wooden eggs or ceramic eggs, or we can use refillable plastic eggs or whatever is in the shape of an egg. Because again, the egg, it's not that its not that I deny the symbolism of an egg from say a wild bird that is still a beautiful symbol of hope and renewal. I'm not going to go take the egg, right? Because it could have it could have been fertilized and I don't want to take the little baby. The point is, it the eggs do represent hope. It's just that the actual eggs from the chicken egg industry, they do not represent that at all. And in fact, they re- represent and are quite literally something altogether different because they quite represent and signify something quite different literally the opposite. So the point is, we can still use the egg as a symbol for life and birth and hopes. We could still use that symbol. Better yet, when we're talking about Easter, a more authentic and consistent symbol for spring would be a flower bulb, because it's more than just a symbol. They really do hold the promise of life, and they deliver the promise of life, and nobody's hurt in the meantime. And so I've modified my traditions to reflect who I am today and what I believe today. And none of them make my observance of any holiday less significant. That's what we do as human beings. We kind of modify the details of our traditions and our rites and our rituals. And that's the case for Passover as well. So Passover is a Jewish holiday, a Jewish festival that commemorates the exodus of the Hebrews, later called the Israelites, out of Egypt and thus from slavery to freedom. And Passover centers around the beginning of Passover, which is the Seder meal, which is on the, it's on the first night of Passover. And it is a big food holiday. And it is a holiday that is really characterized by symbolism and ritual. It is a holiday where every food and beverage chosen represents an element of the narrative told in Exodus in the Bible that signifies the journey 
to freedom. And so you have, for instance, as part of the Passover dinner, the Passover Seder, you have six symbolic foods on the Seder plate. And these six symbolic foods play a very important role. They're used to tell the story, to recount the story of the Exodus. But like Easter representing renewal and rebirth, these Seder foods convey the elements of the powerful message of Passover, that freedom is possible, that slavery can end, and that the future can be better than the past. And so to make the holiday more special, many families use a decorative ceramic Seder plate. So we're going to talk about the Seder dinner, which is the more broad aspect of this, of the Seder, the first night. But the Seder plate in particular, you'd have this Seder plate of these six symbolic foods. And a lot of families have a very special ceramic plate. It could have been a plate that was handed down over generations, or it could be something new that was made. But the idea is that you'd have this special Seder plate. And if you go searching for them online, you could just search for like ceramic Seder plate. And you'll see that each section is labeled with the food's name in Hebrew or in English of each of these six symbolic foods. And when you look at what these six symbolic foods are, two of them don't align with the values of Jewish vegans. So let's take a look at what a Seder plate consists of so you can see what I mean. And so you can craft your own your own vegan version. So first you have haroset, which represents the mortar that Jews worked with when they were enslaved by the Egyptians. Now you have two different types of recipes, and we'll talk more about the difference, generally speaking, between Ashkenazi and Sephardic Jews. But if you imagine like a date paste or a date truffle, that is what the more Sephardic version of the recipe would be. And so you can imagine it being very paste-like to kind of represent that mortar. The Ashkenazi version of haroset is, a, it's still paste-like, but it's a bit chunkier. It's made with apples and walnuts and cinnamon and wine, but it has a little bit of a different texture and taste than the one made with figs and dates. Delicious in both cases, but that's one food, one symbolic food of the Seder plate. Next, you have bitter herbs, and you have kind of two different bitter herbs. You have bitter herbs that symbolize the bitterness and harshness of slavery. And one of these tends to be horseradish. And then you have another, more bitter herbs, because there was because slavery is pretty harsh and bitter. And so you have another plate signifying that bitterness of slavery. And that's usually with romaine lettuce, the hearts of romaine or endive. And then you have a green vegetable, could be parsley, could be other kinds of green vegetable, types of green vegetable, and that represents new life. But that green vegetable is dipped in salt water, and that signifies the tears of the slaves. So those are four of the six symbolic foods. And the oldest member usually leads the Seder and refers to each of these objects while telling the story. And as you can hear, many of these, well, these are all plant foods, right? These are traditionally part of the Seder plate. Typically speaking, the haroset would be vegan. By default, sure, some people might use honey in the recipe, but not always. And so it's pretty much vegan by default. And then, of course, the other items, horseradish and green bitter herbs and green vegetables, obviously already plant-based. But there are a few animal products that are also used as part of the Seder plate, used as symbols, namely a boiled egg to symbolize new life, and a shank bone to represent the lamb who was sacrificed for Passover. Now, a vegan Seder is not only traditional in its own right, it reflects the principles of freedom and mercy that signify this holiday. So for the shank bone of a lamb or a goat, which is meant to represent the lamb who was offered for sacrifice, the most common And most traditional vegetarian or vegan substitute for the shank bone is a roasted beet or just a beet whose bloody appearance is used to represent that sacrifice, the lamb, the blood of the lamb. And that's even referenced as a Passover Seder option in the Talmud. So it has been an accepted alternative. This isn't new. (laughs) It's not in the last five years because veganism became trendy. It is referenced as a Passover Seder option in the Talmud. And while the shank bone is not meant to be eaten, it's a bone, 
you can prepare the beet in a way to be eaten because you can you, you can eat from the Seder plate as part of the ritual, but it could also just remain unmeaten, uneaten during the meal and remain just a symbol. Now, I asked my friend Jackie, whose Seder we're attending, what she does in place of the shank bone. And she, it's really cute. She sent me a picture. It, she uses a cookie cutter shaped as a bone, you know, like a dog's bone kind of thing, and uses it to shape tofu, a block of to- tofu. So she takes that cookie cutter and cuts a block of tofu. And she puts that bone uh, as the symbol of replacing the shank bone, which is pretty adorable. And then the other one, as I mentioned, is the boiled egg. And that's the symbol. So again, this is a symbol of fertility and new life. And it doesn't have the same long established traditional substitute that the shank bone has, but there are acceptable options used by Jewish vegans in place of the chicken's egg. So you can have kind of similar to what I was saying about the Easter alternatives to an actual chicken's egg. You can have something non-edible that looks like an egg. It could be a plastic egg. As I mentioned, it could be a smooth rock, could be a wooden egg. You could use a seed uh, because again, they hold the potential for new life. And maybe you wouldn't maybe put a little tiny seed on the plate, but you could use something like an avocado pit, which is essentially a seed. And that symbolizes new life, just like the chicken's egg would, but even more appropriately so. And You can also get a pretty large avocado pit, which mimics the shape of an egg. So you're kind of getting both there. You can use the type of eggplant that's round and white that looks like an egg. You know what I'm talking about? And if your tradition allows rice on Passover, and I'll talk about why I just said that in a moment, this is another vegetarian Seder option given in the Talmud. So rice is a perfect alternative to the egg on the Passover Seder plate. So you can... Pick which one works for you. You've got lots of options. Now, I mentioned the ceramic Seder plate for this holiday, but if you go and look for one that reflects you being vegan, you will be hard-pressed to find one. You will find Seder plates or can find Seder plates that don't have any labels at all, so that won't say, because again, the six little individual bowls or however it's designed will say in English or Hebrew or both, it will say bitter herbs, lettuce, haroset, shank bone, egg, like it'll be written on the plate. And that's where you put the shank bone, that's where you put the egg, that's where you put the bitter herbs, where you put the horseradish, what what have you, right? For decades, I have been wanting to create a vegan version of these ceramic plates because even though you can put the beetroot where it says shank bone and the avocado pit where it says egg, how nice would it be if it instead said beetroot and seed? So just saying, I'm working on this. I've, I've got some things up my sleeve. And I can't say too much right now, so stay tuned. In the end, the Seder plate can be anything from a special dish that's been passed down or a dish that you borrow. It could be a very simple version. The most important thing is that it has spaces for each of the six symbolic foods referred to in the Haggadah. The Haggadah means telling in Hebrew, and it's a written guide to the Passover Seder which commemorates the exodus from Egypt. The Haggadah includes various prayers and blessings and rituals and fables and songs and information about how the Seder should be performed. The point is, whether we're talking about eggs at Easter or eggs and a shank bone at Passover, they are symbols. And when I hear people say things like, well, it's not traditional to use anything other than eggs, they that's it frustrates me because... We're not hearing what that sounds like. The shank bone and the egg are already symbols. (laughs) They already represent something much more important than the symbol itself. It's just that those symbols have become familiar and status quo. And that's problematic if we become attached to those symbols, because then we're really losing touch with the meaning of whatever it is we're trying to celebrate or honor or commemorate or the story we're trying to tell, especially when someone's harmed in the process. Conversely, when we focus on the meaning rather than on the symbol, we find that a plant-based menu 
whether it's for Easter or for the Passover meal or for the duration of Passover or for the Seder or for the Seder plate, more accurately reflects the significance of our most beloved holidays, including Passover. What better way to celebrate freedom from slavery than to use symbols that don't merely convey freedom and liberation, but that are actually products of freedom and liberation and compassion, i.e. plants. So those are my thoughts about that. (laughs) It is absolutely legitimate, acceptable, and even more appropriate to use symbols other than the shank bone and the chicken's egg for a Passover Seder plate. Now, being a vegan Seder, I have friends including the friends who whose who Seder we're going to join, who have called a vegan Seder a Vader to emphasize the vegan aspect and to create a distinction between it and a non-vegan Seder. But I know you might be listening, my friend, or anybody else who has called a vegan Seder a Vader. I don't agree. And I'm warning you now a rant is about to commence. (laughs) This bothers me almost as much, almost as much as vegans calling Thanksgiving, thanks living, to distinguish a vegan Thanksgiving from a non-vegan Thanksgiving, right? Because Thanksgiving, they will say, is a holiday where millions of turkeys are killed, and there's just bloodshed, and it's violence, and it deserves a different name because I don't celebrate that I celebrate nonviolence and compassion towards animals, right? So that's the idea. Now, listen, I get I'm saying all this with my rant with the very with the very keen awareness that I get wanting to carve out your own distinct identity and to celebrate the thing that does distinct distinguish a vegan from a non-vegan, especially Thanksgiving or in this case, Passover, right? I get that. But I will tell you my thinking about changing the words. And here's my thinking. (laughs) Here's my rant. The reason I don't agree with changing the name Seder to Vader or Thanksgiving to Thanks Living is because, look, let's use Thanksgiving as an example. Thanksgiving has a very long history leading up to what it is today, right? And it has been and will continue to be many things celebrated in many different ways. In other words, it's just as traditional to not have dead turkeys at Thanksgiving as it is to have dead turkeys because it just depends on which flashpoint, touch point you're looking back to, right? So yeah, so since the 1950s, 1960s, turkeys have been used at Thanksgiving. They weren't prior to that. And in fact... Prior to that, like long before that, Thanksgiving was part of the Advent holiday where it was all about fasting and prayer and goodwill and charity. That's what it was about. So, okay, which tradition do you want to adhere to? It's as legit to adhere to the traditional Thanksgiving that harkens back to, you know, kind of simplicity and fasting and mostly plant foods, turkey is certainly as a commercial product, they didn't really come into being in the United States until the 1950s. So it's up to you which touch point, right, which tradition uh, you want to adhere to and incorporate and implement into your own Thanksgiving. So the point is, that's what Thanksgiving is, whatever we want to make it. But when we give the word away, Because Thanksgiving today doesn't reflect who we are, what we believe in, right? Or what we agree with. But you're still giving, but but it can be if you say, no, 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 Thanksgiving is about mercy and compassion and nonviolence towards human and non-human. That's what Thanksgiving is. So why give the word away? (laughs) Why give it away? By giving it away, it's basically saying that that holiday is beyond, it's so beyond claiming it as a compassionate, peaceful holiday. So I have to make my own name for it. No, no, 
<laughs> details within traditions change all the time. And you can see that within the Seder, for instance, right? Whose foundation is very ritual, right? It's about recall. It's about telling that story over and over and over again. That's what the Seder is. And yet even within that history and that tradition, you can still make changes and still adhere to the principles of and honor the Seder. You can still make changes in the little details. It's still a Seder, right? It's perfectly acceptable to replace the shank bone and the egg with plant versions. It doesn't need a different name. You can still replace it and it's still a Seder. And we're going to talk about the rest of the meal too, because of course there are animal products in the meal, but that's also, again, things we change as human beings. We change things all the time. Still legitimately a Seder. Still legitimately a Seder plate if you remove the shank bone and the egg. It's still a Seder. That makes it a Seder. Not eating turkeys at Thanksgiving is absolutely acceptable and widely reflected in millions of American homes. That's still Thanksgiving when you don't eat turkey. So why give away the name? The other problem I have with it, besides devaluing, frankly, I think devaluing the holiday and our participation in it, the other problem I have with it is that it creates an uh, us versus them dichotomy. I celebrate Thanksgiving, not Thanksgiving, because Thanksgiving is full of murder and violence and death. I'm about compassion and mercy. Like, <laughs> okay, so the people who in our lives are going to hear that and go, well, I, I, I'm not like in favor of murder and violence and death, but I celebrate Thanksgiving. Okay, um, well, all right, I guess you go celebrate your thing and I'll do this traditional thing that's mine. And so it just creates this dichotomy and the separation. And for me, compassion is not about separation. It's about connection. And so that doesn't mean you still can't convey to people that Thanksgiving historically and legitimately and conventionally and currently and contemporarily reflects compassion and mercy and nonviolence for human and non-human animals. And so by virtue of that, Thanksgiving without the turkey is as legit as Thanksgiving with the turkey, right? You can still convey that. But Changing the language just makes it sound like that's your holiday and I have my own holiday and never the twain shall meet. That's why I have a problem with changing the language. You're basically giving over. You're just basically giving up on the word and saying, no, you can't celebrate Thanksgiving or you can't celebrate the Seder. You can't participate in the Seder, partake or what have you. Um it's got to be something different. And I don't agree. I don't agree. You know, the, we pick and choose which traditions and which details of the traditions we want to uphold all the time within the frameworks we live in. So change it from the inside. Reflect the compassion and gratitude of Thanksgiving from the inside. You don't have to throw the baby out with the bathwater and kind of create a whole new zeitgeist. Like Thanksgiving to me is about compassion and mercy. And that's why I don't eat turkeys. <laughs> period. That's what it's about. The Seder is about celebrating and commemorating freedom and mercy and new life and new beginnings and hope. Okay, by virtue of that, that means there's no animal products. So within the framework of the Seder or Thanksgiving as examples, you can celebrate that from the inside. And as I said, I think not having the animal products is more conducive to the principles of Passover. Thanksgiving, etc. That's the point. That's what the Seder is all about, that freedom is possible, that slavery can end, and that the future can be better than the past. That is the Seder, and it doesn't need a new word that makes it sound different than what it already is. That's what it is. Rant over. You might not agree, and again, I, I understand wanting to carve your own place, especially being non-vegan, you know, this non-vegan world we live in and you're vegan, you want to you kind of separate yourself and you want to distinguish yourself and you want to make sure people understand you and know you and see you. I get that. It still can be done in a way that doesn't give away our legitimate participation in these holidays. 
So as I said, the Seder dinner is not comprised only of the Seder plate. That's just one element, and it's an important element, but it's just one element. The Seder dinner, frankly, is one aspect of the entire Passover, <laughs> even the Passover the first night, and the whole seven or eight days depends, again, on which um, how you and your family celebrate or what tradition you're from. But the dinner is about all of the dishes in the entire meal, the whole Seder dinner, and the rituals and the stories and the order of it all. In fact, order and ritual are so important to the Seder that it's reflected in the name. Seder is Hebrew for order. And while every home has its own customized variations based on their traditions and their family and how observant they are, it's all about the blessings and the prayers and the stories and the songs and the food and the wine or the grape juice, if you prefer. One significant practice of this holiday meal, as well as for the duration of the meals taken during the seven or eight days of Passover, involves the removal of leavened food. So you would know this, right? You know about matzah during Passover especially. The removal of leavened foods commemorates the fact that when the slaves were fleeing Egypt, they didn't have time to let their bread rise. Matzah represents this unleavened bread, and it's used in many forms throughout the holiday as crackers, as flour, as meal, as breadcrumbs, as bread. And not only is matzah present as a ceremonial element, usually there are three pieces tucked into a special cloth or a napkin next to the Seder plate, but matzah is a huge part of the actual menu of the dishes themselves, so much so that jokes abound about how prevalent it is throughout this meal and throughout all of the meals during the Passover week. Now, in the Jewish cuisine episode, we will talk about the differences between Ashkenazi and Sephardic cuisine, but it's inevitable for me to talk about the differences here as well. So I'm just going to give you a brief distinction between the two. So as a result of the diaspora, the diaspora was the dispersion of Israelites or Jews out of their ancient ancestral homeland and their subsequent settlement in other parts of the globe. That's what the diaspora refers to. Ashkenazi Jews went to Eastern Europe, or I should say, those who went to Eastern Europe and Germany and France are considered Ashkenazi Jews, where those who went to Spain and Portugal and Africa, North Africa, the Middle East, they're considered Sephardic. Now, most Jews in the U.S. are Ash from Ashkenazi descent because of the large population of German and Eastern European Jewish immigrants who arrived in the U.S. between the 1850s and the 1900s. Ashkenazic and Sephardic Jews share the same basic beliefs, but there are differences in culture and in practice, including when it comes to food and especially when it comes to Passover. So while Ashkenazi and Sephardic Jews both avoid leavened foods during Passover, the former, Ashkenazi, avoid additional foods collectively known as kitniyot. The kitniyot collectively includes legumes, lentils, a lot of seeds. So it could be caraway seeds, cardamom seeds, corn, um, flaxseed would be example, peanuts, soy beans would be an example because they're under legumes. And so if you were in this camp, you would already know what to avoid if you're, if you're avoiding a kidney yacht. But Traditionally, Sephardic Jews would eat these foods during Passover. It all comes down to the individual and how observant they are, the families and what their traditions are. So if you're a guest at a Seder dinner and you want to contribute to the meal, just be sure to ask your host how they observe this holiday. So I look forward to sharing with you more about Jewish cuisine in a future episode. We're going to talk about the difference between Ashkenazi, Sephardic, Jewish cuisine, why bagels are considered a Jewish food, why there are Jewish dietary laws in the first place, how Jewish cuisine differs from Israeli cuisine. We have a lot to talk about. But in the meantime, I'm really excited to announce my new recipe bundle over in my shop at joyfulvegan.com. It's 11 recipes for Passover, recipes that are perfect for the Seder dinner, whether you're hosting or bringing dishes to someone else's Seder, but also perfect for the entirety of Passover, the whole season, the whole eight days or seven days. So the recipes in the bundle, this is basically an ebook, include matzo ball soup, borscht, which is beet soup, haroset, noodle kugel, 
We have quinoa, stuffed bell peppers, roasted beets and fennel bulbs with fennel oil, matzo pizza with cashew mozzarella, mushroom walnut pate, matzo chocolate brittle, flourless chocolate tart, coconut macaroons, and the elements of the Seder plate. Now, you can get this all at joyfulvegan.com. And I have 11 recipes because the, the matzo ball soup was also in the Hanukkah recipe bundle, the ebook. But I wanted to make sure, obviously, it's here. But I also have another soup in case you're just like done with the matzo ball soup and you want some borscht. So we've got borscht as the recipe, as the alternative. So you can use either one. So that's why there are 11. There's usually 10 recipes in the recipe bundle, in the recipe bundles. Now, most of the ingredients in these recipes are whole produce. And some of them include store-bought ingredients such as olive oil, balsamic vinegar. But if you're keeping kosher for Passover, just double check your commercially bought ingredients before using, especially if it's something you want to be mindful of if you're bringing foods to someone else's home. The fact is, I included ingredients that you should have no problem finding certified kosher, period. But again, depending on how observant you are or your host is or their guests are, you're going to want to double check if they're, if the commercial ingredients are kosher for Passover. Your best bet is to check a kosher grocery store or the kosher section of a larger grocery, or one of the many online stores that carry kosher products, especially if they come from Israel, (laughs) because that's where you're going to find a lot of kosher and kosher certified kosher for Passover products. So go over to joyfulvegan.com, grab your Passover recipe bundle. You'll see that these recipe bundles differ a little bit from the library of on-demand classes. The on-demand classes have fewer recipes, but they're accompanied by 90 minutes of video instruction by me. These are the live classes that were converted into on-demand classes. And so you get 60 or 90 minutes, depends on the class, of recipe instruction. And you get the recipes and the resources that correspond with that class. The recipe bundles are essentially eBooks, and they are more recipes, so usually 10 recipes. There's no video instruction, but you get more recipes. So the bundles... I have four of them now. I have Hanukkah, I have Thanksgiving, Christmas, and now Passover. I'll have Easter, and I'm going to have other bundles as well. You're very welcome to ask me about any kinds of themes you're interested in, but that's what we've got right now. And I curate all of these recipes very carefully, whether they're the live in real time online cooking classes that turn into the on-demand classes or their recipe bundles or their cookbooks. I curate my recipes very carefully. So I hope you enjoy these. You can go grab them at joyfulvegan.com. So in terms of the foods themselves and why what's eaten is eaten, let's unpack this a bit. I don't think I said this earlier, but I want to emphasize that Passover is one of the most important religious holidays of the Jewish year. In some previous episodes where I talked about the history and significance of Advent, which is the period in the Christian calendar that leads up to Christmas, I talked also about how Easter and its preceding Lent is the holiest of the Christian holidays. So Easter is the most holy holiday in the Christian calendar. Passover is the most holy holiday in the Jewish calendar. And it is the most significant part of Jewish history, and it's the occasion for special foods. And food is really a huge part of this holiday. (laughs) It's a huge part of this holiday. So the origin of Passover is explained in the book of Exodus in the Bible. So here's how the story goes. Moses, bringing pressure to bear on the Pharaoh in Egypt to let the Hebrews depart from Egypt, He cursed the Egyptians with 10 plagues, the last and most horrific of which was that all the firstborn males in Egyptian families were to die. So to ensure that the deity invoked by Moses would not inadvertently cause the death of the firstborn of Hebrew families on the night of carnage, Moses required all these families to place a sign of blood on their door so that when this carnage was about to ensue, that home would be passed over. Now that blood was to come from a sacrificial lamb. And the word Passover or Pesach in Hebrew means to skip or to gamble like a young lamb would do, but it also means to exclude, to pass over. 
Passover, which is, of course, what had to be done for their dwellings on the night of the slaughter of the firstborn so that those homes were passed over. Now, chametz, which is the unleavened bread requirement during Passover, is a hugely important part of the Passover holiday. In short, chametz includes grains like wheat, oats, rye, barley, and spelt. And these grains are prohibited if they've come in contact with water or moisture for longer than 18 minutes, which would lead to rising or leavening. So leavening agents, obviously, like yeast or sourdough, are also considered chametz. They're forbidden, hence matzah. So while most matzah is made from wheat, the process used to cook the matzah from the time the liquid is added to the flour to the time the matzah is baked can last no longer than 18 minutes. This is the generally agreed upon time, uh, amount of time after which the grain would start to ferment and thus rise. So the wheat is closely supervised to ensure that no water touches it from the time of harvest to the time it is baked. And this is to make sure that no leavening occurs. Now, this is why even with matzah, there's a difference between masha that's certified kosher and matzah that's certified kosher for Passover. So it's just it just kind of elevates it. It just takes it to the next level. So what does that mean for the dishes that you can make and serve? Well, necessity is the mother of invention and all that. And so as a result, there's a whole range of distinctive Jewish variants of dishes making use of ground almonds, potato flour, ground rice, matzah meal, sheets of matzah, lots of matzah, to make all kinds of cakes and pancakes and pies and tarts and dumplings and fritters and so on. Now, the difference between Sephardic and Ashkenazi cuisine is especially pronounced during Passover. I mentioned the kitniyot, which means that there's, again, it just kind of like elevates it. There's just an exclusion of additional foods like the rice and the corn and the millet and the beans and the lentils, etc., because of the potential for those foods to ferment. And so that's why they're, in, they're included as the forbidden foods. Now, you would typically not see the kitniot dishes at an Ashkenazi Seder. They're quite common at the Sephardic Seders. Now, the recipes in the bundle that I mentioned they are essentially what a friend of mine called Ashkafardic. So it's a blend of the two, even though like, everybody has a different line that they draw. So just take a look yourself. And I think you'll be pretty confident that even if you were celebrating an Ashkenazi uh, Seder, you should be fine. But everybody has a different line. So we're heading to LA. It's going to be mostly a Sephardic, well, it is going to be a Sephardic Seder with our friends. And I'm looking forward to cooking. My friend is looking forward to cooking with me because we've never done it together. And I'm just so excited about being part of this Seder. Jackie and Zeev were very helpful in ensuring my recipe bundle was up to Jewish snuff. She has used many of my recipes over the years for both Passover and Hanukkah. And I'm very proud of that. But we just put like a fine tooth comb through the recipes in the Passover bundle to reflect a traditional Seder. Some of these recipes were already in my books for all of these years, but I've reconfigured them. I've just improved them, updated them, added to them. And so now you have them in this nice, perfect little bundle. So let me tell you about a few typical traditional Passover dishes for the Passover meal without accounting for the vegan aspect first. And then I'm going to tell you what you can use instead of the animal products. Now, I'm not going to tell you about the different animal meats that are forbidden, <laughs> or I'm not going to tell you about how mixing dairy and animal meat is forbidden. Like, th that's obvious. There's no animal flesh or fluids on our table. But let me just give you an idea of what a typical Passover menu would look like so you can see what you will already make that's going to be plant-based and appropriate for Passover and what are some things that need just like slight changes, alter alterations to make them vegan and permissible for Passover. So number one, generally speaking, here's what's permissible for the Seder meal as well as throughout the Passover holiday. Any kind of fruit, done, check. Any kind of vegetable, Again, excluding those listed under kitten yacht if that's something you observe. But if it's not something you observe, then any kind of vegetable, any kind, lentils, beans, soy, 
tofu, tempeh, vegetables, green, squash, what have you. Next, nuts, nut flours, pure nut butters, again, excluding those listed under kitneyot, the peanuts, the sesame seeds, the poppy seeds, the flax seeds, right? If that's something you observe. If it's not something you observe, all nut flours, all nuts, all nut butters. Next, quinoa. Most sources agree that quinoa is not technically a grain because it's not. It's actually a seed. So most sources agree that it's permissible during Passover because it's not a grain. It's actually a seed. Next, spices. Pretty much all spices are game unless you are adhering to kitneyot, which means you would avoid certain seeds, cardamom seeds, cumin seeds, flax seeds. They would be avoided. But if that's not something you're observing, then all spices are game. Herbs, all of them are game. All herbs, all herbs, especially those bitter herbs like the horseradish, like the romaine lettuce, like the endive, which symbolize the bitterness of slavery. You can include them, of course, incorporate them into your Passover menu. They don't have to just be on the Seder plate. Stock or broth made from vegetables, fantastic. Now, any packaged product with a kosher for Passover stamp of approval from a kosher organization is considered acceptable for Passover consumption. So keep in mind that those keeping strictly kosher will look for a kosher for Passover stamp of approval on any and all packaged food products used during Passover, including nuts, including quinoa, including spices, including matzah products, because I mentioned that some of them are kosher, but some of them are kosher for Passover. Not all kosher matzah products are kosher for Passover. So this depends on how observant you are and how observant your host is. So just ask. So generally speaking, there are lots of options for a vegan Seder, Let's go through some of the specifics, those that are already plant-based by default, like I mentioned the choroset before, and those that need some slight modifications. Now, choroset, some recipes out in the world call for honey. Most rely on the sweetness from the dates or the apples or the cinnamon. So I'm characterizing choroset as typically already a plant-based dish. Add a Seder. Done. Check. And that's in the recipe packet. An Israeli salad is made up of crisp cucumbers and tomatoes and lemon juice and olive oil. It's a wonderful kind of Middle Eastern Mediterranean salad. And now you know this holiday means we're getting into spring. So you'll have a lot more options in terms of these wonderful, delicious, fresh spring vegetables. Already plant-based, already a lovely dish for this spring holiday. Lots of salads, in fact, are perfect for the Passover dinner. Green salads, beet salads, squash salads, you know, quinoa salads. You can make tabbouleh, for instance. So lots of salads. There are just a million salad ideas, just as long as you're incorporating the permissible foods I just mentioned. You have a million options, especially if you're vegan. You're like, oh yeah, got that. (laughs) Got that in the bag. Check. Roasted potatoes or mashed potatoes, they'll often be on the Passover table. Also, already, especially the roasted potatoes, already plant-based, a little bit of olive oil, salt and pepper, you're good to go. Bob's your uncle. For the mashed potatoes, you can use you can use olive oil. You can use, of course, non-dairy butter. Depends on where you draw the line. There might be some non-dairy butters that are kosher. They might not be kosher for Passover. Again, it depends on where you draw the line, but potatoes would be on the Passover dinner table, the Seder dinner. Now, soups, there's so many soup options. We mentioned the obvious, which is the matzo ball soup. I'm going to come back to that. I mentioned the borscht, which would be a very typical Ashkenazi soup. That's beet soup. So delicious. It's one of my favorite soups like on the planet. I just love borscht. And you can do other soups. You could do carrot soup. You could do cauliflower soup. You could do potato soup. You could do so many different kinds of soups. I asked Jackie. I said, Jackie, I said, how come you don't have borscht on the menu? And she says, because because matzo ball soup. (laughs) So it's such an obvious one that not a lot of people want to swap out the matzo ball soup because it's so traditional. And it's just such a significant part of the Passover meal. Now I have a version of my matzo ball soup, or I have a matzo ball soup version that I'm very proud that many of my Jewish friends and readers have been using for years. And I'm really proud of it. That is indeed in the vegan Passover recipe bundle. So enjoy it. Typically, 
non-veganly speaking, the matzo balls would use chicken's eggs for binding. Chicken's eggs would be used for binding the matzo balls, and the broth would most often be chicken stock, but of course not in mine, not in mine. Kugel is another dish that's in my recipe bundle. Kugel hails from Germany. Essentially, kugel is a baked casserole with a starch. That's kind of the general way to think about it because there's so many different variations of kugel. The starch is usually noodles or potatoes, plus eggs, not in our case, and fat. Now, while that's the basic idea, kugels, like I said, have so many variations. Sometimes they're savory, sometimes they're sweet, sometimes they're potato-based, sometimes they're noodle-based. The word kugel comes from German, meaning sphere, and that refers to the dumplings that made up the kind of the earliest version of the kugel. My version in the vegan Passover recipe bundle is noodle-based, and it's on the sweeter side. It's one of my favorite things on the Passover table. Any green vegetables, like I said, any vegetable, broccoli, asparagus, Brussels sprouts. I'd go for the spring vegetables, which would be the asparagus and whatever you can find at your local farmer's market or in your local grocery, your local farm stand. Again, this is spring, so just really celebrate the spring vegetables. Really any kind of vegetable, roasted, steamed, air fried, whatever you do to it, acceptable. I see a lot of butternut squash and various squash dishes for Passover. Personally, by April... It's spring in California. I realize it's not spring everywhere else. <laughs> like even though technically it's spring, I know that around many parts of the United States and other parts of the world, it's kind of teetering between winter and spring vegetables. So if that works for you, go for it. I just kind of love that spring and this, you know, or Easter and Passover are really the first holidays that really just really bring in the spring holiday. So I really prefer to kind of focus on the spring vegetables. That's my preference. But if butternut squash soup or squash, you know, salads or casseroles are your thing and you're still able to get that locally and seasonally, go for it. That's also fine. And then there are things that are decidedly not vegan, not vegetarian. And we have vegan solutions for them as well because brisket I don't even know what the hell brisket is brisket's just like some I don't know animal part slab bit side I don't know (laughs) brisket is definitely on the non-vegan Passover table not on our table I don't have a specific vegan version of that. You can find vegan versions of that, but I don't tend to do that. I'd rather focus on the vegetables. Even chopped liver. We're going to talk more about chopped liver in the Jewish cuisine episode and why chopped liver tends to be part of Jewish cuisine. We'll talk about why. But you will often see chopped liver as an item in a non-vegan, non-vegetarian Passover spread table. And that's one of the reasons I have the mushroom pate in the recipe bundle. That was a contribution by Jackie because a lot of what Jackie does, and like I get this, this is what I do for my meals, is I've talked about this before that when we talk about, you know, I'm vegan now, I'm vegetarian, but I really crave meat. No, we don't. One of the things we crave, quote unquote, is just something that's familiar. And so when you're crafting your own menu, of course it's going to reflect what you grew up with, what your favorite foods were, what your favorite dishes were, what your favorite recipes are, because that's going to be part of the emotional experience. It's going to be a touchstone for you to your from your childhood to your childhood, and then certainly for your children or anybody else you carry these traditions onto. So for Jackie, chopped liver was always part of her, you know, that's what she associates with a non-vegan Passover, right? And same thing with Well, I'll come to the other ones as well. But so chopped liver, not something I ever ate, not something I would put into a a meal or even a version of it. But she said, no, 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 the pate is perfect. The, the, The mushroom walnut pate that I have in the recipe packet, it's perfect because it's just reminiscent. So totally plant based, totally delicious. Nobody was harmed in the making of it, but it's reminiscent of the thing that you want to recall. And there's nothing wrong with that. Matza brai is a dish also from Ashkenazi Jewish origin. And it's made, it's basically fried matzah with chicken's eggs. So it's often like scrambled eggs with matzah. 
in there as well. It's often eaten as a breakfast food during the Jewish holiday of Passover. You can sometimes find it on the Passover dinner table. And so basically, you can do a vegan version of the matzah brai by using just egg or scrambled tofu. Tofu is in your purview or chickpea flour if that's also permissible for you and you can basically make an eggless scrambled eggs with some fried matzah thrown in you can jazz it up you can add some non-dairy cheese you can add some grilled onions you can add favorite herbs and spices you can make it more of an omelet so you have lots of options there as well to make the matzah brai that's b-r-e-i sometimes it's spelled b-r-i-e but usually you'd see it b-r-e-i matzah brai and then desserts anything with matzah <laughs> like is a great dessert uh and nothing with leavening ingredients so in my bundle i've mentioned i have the matzah brittle it's the chocolate brittle flourless chocolate tart and the classic coconut macaroons you can drizzle the macaroons with chocolate you can dip them in chocolate uh, I mentioned to Jackie, I was going to, I said to Jackie, I know you're listening, Jackie. So I said, because I was testing them and I said, well, I'm going to add a little lemon zest because I love lemon zest in macaroons. And she said, no, don't. I'm like, why? Because <laughs> she's like, that's not the macaroons that I grew up with. And that's I, that I associate with, with Passover. They just have to just keep it simple and just make it the macar, just make it. Okay, fine. Jackie. But I do love the idea of lemon zest in them as well. But again, she's trying to recall what she knew, what was her childhood, what she associates with this holiday. And that's what we all do, however we grew up, whatever religious holidays we celebrate, whatever traditions we commemorate, whatever it is, that's what we do so often is we want some kind of touchstone to the past. And we can do that while still adhering to our values. You can also make chocolate dipped strawberries. I have a recipe for that in my store. You can find a bundle with that recipe at joyfulvegan.com. Meringue cookies, same thing, using aquafaba. I've got those in my Easter recipe bundle. Fruit salad, nice cream, lots of options for desserts. And finally, wine is a big part of the Seder. It's traditional to drink four cups throughout the evening. And keep in mind that while it's traditional to drink wine, some guests prefer grape juice, and that's a perfectly acceptable alternative. So these little tweaks you can make that still make it a Seder, you don't have to call it something else, are perfectly acceptable because the whole spirit of the holiday is there and everything else and all the other rites and rituals are being honored. So you can make just a couple changes and still honor this holiday. You do not have to change the name. And that is my message is that we can adhere to traditions while honoring our values. We don't have to sacrifice one for the other. I hope this has been informative for you. I hope it's been fun. I hope it's been inspiring. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Please forgive me if I have pronounced anything incorrectly. I did my best and I hope you enjoyed the recipe bundle. I'm really proud of it. I hope you have a happy Passover. Pesach Semiach. Thank you, as always, to benefactors David Cabrera and Alexander Gray, Angels, Brooke Boussard, Michal Stone, Gina Stryler, Carrie Parker, and Risa Rivakov. Thanks to my heroes, Simon Small, Angelica Lofton, Jennifer Statmiller, Jennifer Watkins, Geraldine Hilmar, PJ Schuster, Denise Hoskins, Ranjini Mohan, Tina Strassheim, and Liz D. You can join them by becoming a supporter at joyfulvegan.com slash donate. For the animals, this is Colleen Patrick Goudreau. Thanks for listening.